Every one of us has had the experience where you were in a hurry and you rushed out the door and you forgot something. Many of you have forgotten your coffee mug on top of the car as you were uh, uh, in a rush to get to work. Well, this morning I was ready. Had the suit on, had the tie on, had the shoes on, going out the door, and all of a sudden I realized I didn't shave. Went back in the, in the mirror to look and see, will this pass? You've been there, right? Will anybody notice? Or maybe you had a tie that has stain on it, or a shirt, or a jacket. I'm going to cover it up. Will this pass? Look in the mirror. No, it's not going to pass. So here comes the jacket off, the tie off, the shirt off, and start shaving real quick. Interesting that that's the way we treat our sanctification, our progressive sanctification, our holiness. Wouldn't it be interesting if somehow, in a sad way, we were to wear our sins on our face? Think about that. Kind of like leprosy. Once you commit a sin, like Pinocchio, something happens and it looks really bad. You can't leave the house because you got this thing hanging off your forehead. Whatever the sin was, you can't hide it. But we're so good at hiding our sins. And actually our attitude and response would be, just like we were, I asked myself this morning, will this pass? A little bit of gel, a little bit of water, a little bit of combing, will this pass? Will anybody notice? And the first thing I thought when I saw my shadow, I thought of web. Oh, you shaved through a screen door again today, didn't you? You have no idea how many times I've heard that from web. Kind of like people pointing at you saying, oh, your attitude is running ahead of you, isn't it? Or your judging attitude is really uh, causing some craters in the people's lives around you, isn't it? Or think about maybe, maybe your sins, if you can't see them on your face, people could smell them from your armpits. But we're good at covering up these sins. We can praise the Lord and sing. And it means nothing because we give Him nothing in return. Like these magi having brought him gold as to a king, frankincense as to a high priest, a priest and a sacrifice at the same time. How much more in Hebrews 9.14, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience From dead works? Why? Why have we been cleansed? We are positionally, eternally, holy before God because and in His blood. But that's not where it ends. That is the life-giving power for you and I to begin to progress. Progressive sanctification. Growing in our holiness because now we have the power to say no to sin. And the love to embrace the beauty and the purity of a holy life. You've been cleansed your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We talked about the interesting verse last week. When Jesus prays in John 17, Father, I sanctify myself for them understanding that what it meant for him to say that he is dedicating himself he is drinking the cup he is sanctifying or dedicating his life as a sacrifice for them this is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world and Jesus said let it be so I lay my life down But that phrase comes back to me and says, am I sanctifying my life for them and for his glory ultimately and as a priority? What does that mean? And we come to this last and final step of the frankincense, uh, this aroma that comes before the Lord. 
This beautiful smell that the Lord enjoys when he sees a life that loves him enough to purify himself, ourselves, from our minds, our thoughts, our intentions of the heart, to our actions. And here is the strength, not just the strength, the why, and what happens when we are dedicating our lives to that, but also the steps. What does practical sanctification look like? What does it mean when, when I walk with the Lord and, and my life is different, not to be seen, but an aroma to be sensed and people are drawn to your life because of the way you live and think and the way you impact the lives of others? The strength and the steps of sanctification. We touched upon this at the end of last week about this iceberg. You only see 10% of it. 90% is below the water. But the more the sun melts that 10%, what's below the water rises up and that gets melted. And that would be my life and my sin. The things that I hate and I do, I hate those that I battle against them. And the closer I am to the Lord Jesus in the Word... The more I have the strength to defeat those sins. And we'll talk about the fact that, you know what, when temptation comes in, in a strategic way of battling the sin in your life, if you allow that sinful thought to run one lap around your mind, you've lost the battle. The moment that sin knocks on your door, that's when you say, Jesus, and you open up the Word of God, you remember the Word of God, you declare the Word of God, you read it, you memorize it, and you begin to meditate, because if you wait one lap of that thought to go around your mind, you've lost the battle. Not only are we drawn into God's presence. Remember we talked about the holiness of God that Moses encountered. And God said, take your shoes off. And you know what? When they brought the people by the mountain, God said, don't let even the beasts to come near the mountain and touch that mountain for they will surely die. That holiness is not the intent to harm. It's the beauty of the presence of the essence of all light, no darkness that intrinsically destroys sin. But now, because the cross in Jesus, God wants us to draw near. There is that desire of drawing the sheep and embracing them, having forgiven them. We're drawn to His presence. Look at Isaiah 57, 15. And you wonder what this manger looks like to which the Magi had come? You wonder what should your life look like this year as we draw near the Lord and want Him to use us? What does the manger of my heart look like? Isaiah tells us, For thus is the one on high. He is high and lifted up who dwells forever. He's eternal. Whose name is Holy. Seraphim say, Holy, Holy, Holy. I dwell on a high and holy place. But wait, but wait. And also with the crushed. Why is God doing this to me? That's the question. Why all the hardships? Why all the struggles? Why all the pain? Why all the tragedy? He's bringing it to a place where God loves to hang out. The crushed. Also with the crushed and lowly of spirit. Well, how do I become lowly of spirit? Nothing but the cross. Only the cross will bring you in that sense of freedom. We could learn something from the homeless. The ones that push their belongings in the cart. They have no bills. They don't have the worries we have. Don't lose what you got. They've got nothing. They're free in their way. This loneliness, this humility, having been crushed, now you're in God's presence in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the crushed, not to keep you there, but to breathe that new life, that sense of being set free frankincense, aroma, fragrance, the sweet smell of holiness. What is the purpose 
in this power of sanctification. God says, be holy for I am holy. Why? Why does God want me to be holy? It's so hard. Right? Yeah. Sometimes it feels like fighting against sin and desiring. The heart wants it. The flesh fights it. But there's a battle. Therefore, you're alive. Because if there was no battle, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. But fighting towards sanctification is like running in your dream. You know that feeling? You're trying to run fast because something is chasing you, but the harder you try, the slower you go. But then when you relax, you're catching up speed. Now we're getting somewhere. Because you will not be holy. You will not be sanctified in and of your own power. But how do I do it? If, will God do it through osmosis? No, He won't. There is this continuous surrender, realization of that sin, and continuous surrendering and being fully, mindfully set on the Word, on the Scriptures, and on Jesus. Because it is the Word that has the power to break through that sin. The power of sanctification. Because this here we come in and we ask the question, what gifts can you offer Jesus? How do you live your life this year to bring Him glory? For the Lord to say, I am well pleased in you, Greg, David, Marion. What have I done? He looks at us now and he sees Jesus. But then John says, when I see my children walk in the faith, in the truth, I am ecstatically happy, says Apostle John. When God sees you growing in that sanctifying faith, wrestling and winning one step at a time, God is pleased. What, what can you bring the Lord that would honor Him? As we give gifts to each other, we say, is it, is it what you've always wanted? Does this make you happy? Sadly, today, because we know each other so little, uh, a gift card works a lot better, or a returnable gift does even better. Go ahead and get whatever you want, but not with the Lord. Because the Bible says the gift that He has given us, He does not regret. And they're the perfect gifts. So, do you give the Lord a gift? They say, Lord, if you don't like it, ah, get something else. No. Yeah, and think of, think of the woman, the woman in the temple that she brings is two pennies. And Jesus says, listen, that woman, she gave more than everybody else because she gave the last that she had. Now, here's the problem. We like that because in a way, through our sanctification of life, we give the Lord only two pennies. And we say, Lord, I hope that's enough because that's all I got. You're not getting any more. This is my temper. This are my genes. This is my family. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. Does that honor God? Turn to 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And by the way, I am excited that we can put these up here, but they mean nothing if you don't open up your Bibles. If you don't open up your own Bibles, turn them on, underline, make the notes the Holy Spirit tells you, not the ones we give you. This is just, you know what this is? Uh, all of your mechanics out there, when the car doesn't start, back in the day with the carburetor, you got that spray, that starter fluid, and it just Blows it in there to start it up. That's what this is. So open your Bibles and look at 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you. See, it's impossible for the carnal man to please God. All we do is sin without the Lord. But see, sanctification is the work that God has already begun in you. Something you could not do. And God says, here it is. The Holy Spirit within you. Now you can live a life that is holy. Such were some of you. But look, you were washed. The Lord took care of it. He washed and cleansed your heart and your mind, your intentions. You were sanctified. That's the positional before God. You are holy. You will remain holy. But now is the growing part the maturing part. You are sanctified. You were justified. If these three things would not have happened from the Lord, you could never live a life of 
progressive sanctification. And there's joy. There's greater joy when you defeat that ever-entangling sin than, than if you were to catch a fish or, or down a hunt. You win. You're being transformed. You no longer think like you used to think. You no longer talk like you used to talk. You don't react to people like you used to react because you're washed, sanctified, and justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. It is not just a, a, a ritual, a prayer, something that comes and goes. This is the real thing. That's why we say we're born from above. We've been given this eternal life to fulfill our calling. As a new believer, you don't get on the train and look out the window and wait till you get to the gates of heaven. As a new believer, now you got a calling, you got a purpose. And you know what? You've got to be sanctified to be used by God. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, 14. Just as He chose us in Him, in Jesus, before the foundation of the world. And by the way, because Jesus chose you, He did not choose you for 20 years or 40 years up until that point where you fell for a sin or whatever. He chose you from eternity to eternity. Just as He shows you before the foundation of the world. Why? That we would be holy. Why am I a Christian? That I would live a holy life. Blameless before Him. And all of this, not in fear, not in guilt, but in love. There is no growth in your progressive sanctification if you don't do it because you love if you do it because of fear, you will hate it. You will hate him, you'll hate the word, you'll hate the church, you'll hate everything. He says, all of this is in love. So if I'm not living a holy life, it's not an idea, oh, I better fear hell. My question is, I better fall in love with Jesus. If I never have before, I better fall in love with him now. And if I have been, I got to love him more. All of this in love, his love. And now I love because he first loved me. And now I know what love is. All of this is being a sweet-smelling aroma, not only to the Heavenly Father, but to all those around me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Here's that word again, fragrance. Being a blessing to others is not doing what is convenient or efficient, or it doesn't cost you. Being a blessing to others brings life back into your life from the Holy Spirit because you're spending out of your own and God full, full, or fills back in what you have poured out. But in doing that, you live out the calling and the purpose and now you know why you're alive. For we are a fragrance of Christ, first of all, to God. It is Him in me that brings this beautiful offering of aroma before God among those who are being saved. So the idea of you being sanctified to your brothers and sisters, you are an aroma. People walk in. You know when you walk in those stores, Bed Bath & Beyond or whatever else in the store, and they got all of these candles burning and all of these uh, fragrance sticks. You never want to leave. You like it. Smells good, feels good, changes your attitude. That is the impact that you have on your brothers and sisters. Best way to serve them is to sanctify your life. To those who are being saved and your fragrance among those who are perishing. So before you say John 3.16, before you preach a great sermon, be sanctified. Be holy. And you ask, what does that mean? Oh, you hold on. You build up that question because it's not a matter of the way you dress or the way you walk. He's got a tie. I got a jacket. And now we must be holy together. It'll, these clothes got nothing to do with it. Holiness is not in the way we look. Not even the way we talk. It's the being that makes a difference. Who you are from within. I was just talking to somebody the other day. You see, in Ephesians chapter 
for. We'll get to that later. He says, do not be drunk with wine for its dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, that contrasting command to leave and to embrace. Someone said, listen, I knew somebody back then that was drinking so much, we didn't know it, but he smelled like cologne all the time, strongly. He would come to work, and all he could do is smell that stink of cologne and constantly chewing gum. Because he was drinking so much, the pores of his body were emanating the smell of alcohol. You been there? Smell that? That's exactly what this fragrance is on the holy part. So much of the Lord in my life, whenever I bang my hand with a hammer, hallelujah comes out. <laughs> or, the door, or the door catches my hand or the brother stabs me in the back. What comes out? Love. Why are they stabbing me? So they can see that inside you is grace. Grace, love, forgiveness. Not only is this power of sanctification, this fragrance to the non-believers and the believers, but this sanctification begins to shine a light towards the cross. Not in a religious holier than thou where we shine the light in people's faces. Look how good I am and look how miserable you are. That's not it. It's shining a light towards Jesus from a humble heart. Look at Philippians 2.15. So that you will be blameless and innocent. You can't be accused. There's no habitual sin in your life or affecting or offending others. Say, oh yeah, I know, I know that guy. I know how he is. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know him too. Yep, that's it. He's classified. In this case, there is no blame. There is, he's innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked, perverse generation. They don't deserve it. You're holy because of him. How do I say thank you for my salvation, sanctification of my own life? I love God. How much do you love God? Do you love God enough to change the way you live, the way you talk, your habitual sins that so easily entangle your feet? Crooked, perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Not lights of being uh, uh, superstars, but lights pointing to the cross. But you see... Sanctification being holy, it's not a choice, it's a command. Actually, it's the proof that new life has taken place. If you feel that you live in a continuous battle that you keep losing, you don't ask God why, you go back to the cross and truly repent, truly be born again, instead of playing a game of religiosity. First Peter chapter 115, Peter comes along and God uses him to finally lay it down. If you haven't gotten what I'm trying to say, here it is, says God. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves. It doesn't say wait till you die to finally be holy. It says right now because you're reading and you're breathing, you got to be holy. Want to have a blessed year with the Lord? Shining lights towards the cross and salvation for your family? Change. Be holy, because He is holy. Be holy yourselves in all your conduct. What's the purpose? Can we just shuffle our way to heaven? Just kind of get there. Why? Why should we strive and embrace this battle to be holy? First of all, there's no other way to bring glory to God by being useful. To be of use and bring glory to God. As the Father sends me, I send you. You must go and make disciples. You must go and you must heal. You must preach. You must touch lives. If you're not holy... How many of you, when you're thirsty, you go to the kitchen and you go into the dirty side of the sink and you take the dirtiest mug and you put water in it and drink? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You don't cook out of dirty cookware, do you? So here's the master wanting to cook and drink. He's looking for something that's useful. 
Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. First purpose of sanctification is to be of use. But you see, part of being used by God is part of that abundant life. It goes back to being a two-year-old when they build their first little wooden car uh, at five or whatever age they are. Or, or the little one, Ashley, not Ashley, but the, uh, the painting and giving us, giving me a card. And it's not a, Pic- well, yeah, it's probably a Picasso. It's not a Rembrandt. But she said, I did this. And I accept it and say, wow, this is great. When you are sanctified and you win that sin, like win the victory or the battle against that sin, God says, I'm going to use you now. And, and God uses you. And you see the first person accept Jesus and being born again. Not just in this church, but if we ask the question in any church in this country, how many of you have led somebody to Christ? The hands will be very few. And that breaks our heart. But for those of you that have seen people accept Jesus, under your testimony, the Lord using you, there's nothing like it. You're watching somebody's eternity change before your very eyes. And you say, God, you're merciful. I want to do this for the rest of my life. That's the reason why the church is so infantile and it doesn't know how to serve because they've never seen somebody win someone to Christ. We must be crying out like like Hannah, saying, give me a child or I die. That's how we must desire winning people to Christ and disciple people. And that doesn't come unless we're sanctified. Now in a large house, they're they're not only gold and silver vessels, also vessels of wood and clay, some to dishonor, uh, some, uh, some to honor, and some to dishonor. So don't just sit there and notice and say, oops, I'm no good, toss me out. He says, no, no, listen, therefore, you're not meant to be of dishonor. Therefore, cleanse himself um, from these things. He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master. Me, coach, send me in, coach. I want to play. Remember that feeling when you're on the sideline as a kid in high school or grade school? I want to play. Here it is. Cleanse yourself of these things, and you'll be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, living life to its fullest. Second, ah, I missed the last phrase. Having been prepared for every good work. Before usefulness and good works comes sanctification. Second, To be able to offer God acceptable worship. Abel's sacrifice he received and accepted Cain's he did not. Why? Romans 12, 1, Therefore I exhort you, brothers, I beg you, stop reading. If you don't understand what this means, I'm grabbing you and I'm holding and I'm shaking you. I beg you, I exhort you by the mercies of God. Look at all these Uh, specific expletives that reach out to it's because of God by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a sacrifice living don't take your life live holy and pleasing God because this is your spiritual service of worship what we do if we sing and we have not asked for forgiveness and or forgiven that's not worship I'm begging you, offer your bodies from your mind to your hands to your feet, intentions, your hearts, emotions, offer them up as a spiritual service of worship. And listen, don't be conformed to this world. That's the battle, the other side of the coin. That's the struggle. Do not be conformed. You see, sanctification, the positional happens in an instant in the new birth. But sanctification progressively because you love the Lord and He wants to use you does not happen by using as if we were using an instant diet such as shakes or meals where you lose 10 pounds in two weeks. Look at me. 
Because all of you that have lost 10 pounds in two weeks have gained it back. Twice fold. Losing weight and diet is a change of lifestyle, as my wife says. She's like, I lost a pound this week. And everybody in our household, me, her, and everybody else, we yes, one pound in the right direction. Keep it up. Some of us are like, no, nah, we want to see that drunken, adulterer, drug addict come in the church and say, God changed me. Look what has changed. Well, that calls off for a lot of show and a lot of applause. And before you know it, we're back in the mud, back in the mire. It's that one pound a week. It's that one step. It's that one clinging and fighting, and you get closer to the Lord. Yeah, you're going to fall down, but you're going to get back up. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? Which leads us in a little bit, and how do I do this? By the renewing of your mind. It begins right here. The mind of my heart. What I'm thinking, what I'm contemplating, what I'm desiring, and what I'm moving towards. The renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is. That which is good and pleasing and perfect and it smells great before God. It's good. So you want to offer God acceptable worship? One step, one pound, half a pound of sanctification in your practical living. Third, to have your prayers answered. Because if you're not fighting that fight, the good fight, and against that sin, you can pray till you're blue in the face. God would be like, is anybody talking? Hey, Michael, do you hear anything? I don't hear a thing. Because it's your sins that have raised up a wall, the Bible says in Isaiah. It's not that the Lord's hand is too short. It's your sins. Revelation 5.8. Did you know about this? And when he had taken the scroll, Jesus, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowl full of incense. There's that fragrance. And what is this incense? What is this fragrance that it lifts, that rises before the Lamb? Which are the prayers of the saints. Now we learned this a little bit from 1 Peter chapter 3 in the command that husbands treat your wives well. Don't be harsh. Don't be harsh on them. Because if you are, your prayers will be hindered. In the way that you treat the one you love or all those around you, if your lifestyle is crushing other people, don't bother praying. You better run for the cross and get on your face and repent before you ask for God to lead, answer, feed, help you. And here it is. What is this path to sanctification. I hear all this. Sounds wonderful. It's a new 1999 plan. What do I do? How can I be holy? Can I just change my jacket? Can I just change? What do I, what do, I do? Well, this is where the, the, the road is narrow, but it's straight. It's hard, but it's good. I keep telling my friends that I keep in touch with about our running together um, every day. I do it five days a week. I do not look forward to running. I look forward to finishing. I don't get a runner's high. I get a runner's pain. But I know that when I'm done, I go to the refrigerator and I get a glass of orange juice. And I've never had it so good. That tastes so good. You know what? I've ran again today. I have accomplished again today. I don't run for the high, I run for the finish. This is how we can live a life of maturing in our sanctification. First of all, remember that it's a glorious, amazing work already started by Jesus. He has dug in the path. He has made it straight. 
Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, we can enter the holy of holies. How? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us. This life that's set before you, the good deeds he prepared for you before the time began, here it is. He has inaugurated for us through the veil that is in his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. We're invited. The path has been made. The road is straight and his yoke is easy with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What's the pure water? The word of God. That's the water that keeps on cleansing my mind and my life and gives me that desire which I never knew before to be clean. Yes, the road is narrow, it's straight, but it costs. You know why? Because any sacrifice that is meaningful is costly. It's not like... We haven't done this for about a year now, but I used to have a website, an app on my phone that I could get Pusha anything I wanted, a ring or a necklace, small little stuff. It would cost me $2. It would cost me $3. And it shined so nice for a little bit of time. And she laughed and he goes, yeah, this is the one I want. Don't go spending a lot of money. This is all these little trinkets make me laugh. This is funny. It doesn't work that way with God. Because it cost God everything. It cost him his son. Because you were not cheap. I was not cheap. So God gave everything. This eternal life is costly to Jesus. Empowering us. And here's what we learn. We we learn this from David. You see, we must realize because of the cross... Is Jesus not worthy that we surrender our lives, our habits, our senseless battles and pleasures to him and offer him a life that is sanctified? You see, David would not build an altar for redemption with no cost. He had sinned. He counted the army, and God said, that's it. Judgment is coming. You have to pick three things. You have to pick three things, and one was worse than the other. (laughs) And David said, Lord, I cannot choose. I don't know what to choose, Lord. You choose. Lord, whatever it may be, let not your people suffer from the hands of our enemies. So God said, okay, pestilence. And thousands of people died. And now David wants to, wants to cry out and offer a sacrifice that will bring God's mercy and stop his hand of judgment. And he came to this Aruna. And Aruna, having felt the weight of the pain of the land, said, listen... You can have everything. I'll build the altar for you. I'll give you the sacrifices. I'll give you the land. I'll give you everything. Just do it. So God would stop. And David did not accept. He said, no, I will surely buy it for you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to Yahweh my God, which cost me nothing. Are we not guilty of giving God white elephant gifts? Our leftovers and things that don't cost us anything. And yet we ask for everything from him. David said, no, it must cost. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. You know, often we learn from Scripture that even these offerings, they precede miracles. We ask God for miracles all the time. But it's not the idea that, that thousands of, of uh, uh, oxen and the blood of lambs, they will not satisfy God, but it's the intention of our heart understanding that He is worthy of our surrendered hearts. Look at Joshua. Before they entered Canaan, before they crossed the river, before they faced their enemies, Joshua said to the people, Set yourself apart as holy. For tomorrow Yahweh will do wondrous deeds among you. You want to see God work in your life and bless you? Set your life apart to Him in a practical sanctification and holiness. 
confessing, surrendering, committing, and fighting against the sin in your life. And this is a continuous dedication. You don't do it today and you're done tomorrow because Joshua, Joshua chapter 5 verse 2 says at that time Joshua said, Yahweh said to Joshua, make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again. Wait a minute. Can you see the people? And God said what? Wait a minute. <laughs> you don't understand. We're about to go into battle. You want to just incapacitate the men, the warrior men in your camp? What, you lost your mind? You want to cut what? Where? Imagine that conversation. But he's doing it again. For the second time. We see this mirrored as we are Commanded in 2 Corinthians 7 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Whoa, wait a minute. Isn't holiness per- perfect? Am I not positionally placed before God? God sees me through the blood. I am holy, true. But here in your growth, spiritual growth, you are to perfect that holiness. That means not being sinless, by, but sinning less. Let me jump to my final point. But first must state that this is a circumcision of the heart. It started in Deuteronomy. God will circumcise your heart, the heart of your seed. Love Yahweh with all your heart, all your soul, so that you may live. And then we are called to crucify the flesh. That's how we circumcise the heart, by crucifying the flesh. But I discipline my body, says Paul, and I make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. By the way, that is not a loss of salvation. That's a disqualification from serving him as he was called to be an apostle and a preacher. To him, loving the service and loving serving God so much was losing everything. Everything if he himself was disqualified from the ministry. But because he loved the ministry, he says, listen, I will. It's not buffet my body. We laugh about that all the time. It's I'm buffeting. I'm treating myself harshly, saying no to my desires and pleasures. So I will not be disqualified. All right. How do we do this? Simple. In Ephesians, we read, Paul says, take off the old man and put on the, good, the new man. Take off that old coat, that stain and dirty, put on the new coat. Here's what this looks like. First of all, turn with me to um, Ephesians. First of all, verse 25. Don't lie. Simple. You want practical how you would work on this personal sanctification? Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each other with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be honest with God, yourself, and those around you. Don't lie. Second, be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, nor give the devil an opportunity. That means don't give him a chance to step in and take your mind and twist it into 5,000 different directions of the things you would do, what you want to do, and how much it deserves. No, no. Don't give him an opportunity. Don't sin in anger. You grow in your holiness. Confess it. Speak it out loud. When Satan comes over to tempt you, speak those words out loud to your spouse, your friend, your accountability partner, and say, here's what I'm battling with. Bring him out into the light, and the devil will run away. Use the word of God. Renounce the devil. Thirdly, don't steal anymore. Don't be stingy. Stealing time, stealing emotions, stealing love, and everything else that comes with it. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather be, but must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who, ha- who, who has need. It's not accumulate to put in the bank, accumulate to share. Don't steal, don't be stingy. Verse 29, don't insult people, don't swear. Let no unwholesome word come from your mouth, but only such a word is good for building up what is needed so that it will give grace to those who hear. He stole my notes this morning, but that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in the way we touch people's lives and encouraging them. You want to be holy? What does it look like? Encourage people. Don't swear at people in your mind with your lips. Don't insult them passively. That's holiness. Fifth, do not 
upset the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He keeps you. He sanctifies you. He loves you. He embraces you with the word. Don't get him upset. Meaning, be obedient. And lastly, don't hate people. He read that. Let all bitterness, anger, wrath, slander, shouting be put away from you along with all malice. Holiness does not have to be a sanctimonious, higher religion conversation with synonyms and all sorts of words that leave us speechless. No, this is practical. Take off that old man. The words, the thoughts, the reaction. Put on the new man. Let's make this simple. First of all, you start fighting and you grapple and win in your spiritual sanctification life by starting with your thought life. Offer Jesus as a sacrifice your thoughts, your thinking, good or bad. Surrender. Praise Him for what He's given you. For the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful. The weapons you have available to you are efficient, and they win the victory. What are they? For the tearing down of strongholds, as we tear down speculations or arguments, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And are ready to punish all disobedience, whether your obedience is fulfilled, whenever your obedience is fulfilled. Your thought life, whenever that thought temptation comes in, get on your knees, cry out, say, Lord Jesus, take this lust away from me. Take this desire for this pleasure away from me. Take this anger away from me. Lord Jesus, here it is. I reject it in your name. Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, have this filter on your mind. If the the thoughts and ideas come to you and you put them through this filter, if they fail, cast them away in prayer. Whatever is true, dignified, right, pure, lovely, commendable, any of excellence, anything of excellence, anything worthy of praise, consider these things. Think about these things, everything else, cast them away. So, a life of progressive sanctification begins with your thought life. Second, offer the Lord your life's focus. The main thing in your life should be Jesus on Monday, Jesus on Tuesday, Jesus throughout the week and on Sunday. All I do, I do for Him and through Him and for His glory, meaning abide in Him. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. I am the vine, you are the branches who abides in me and I in Him. Bears much fruit for apart from me. You can do nothing. If you want to do anything, abide in Him. John 15. Thirdly, offer him a spirit-filled life. And that's where we have the command, be filled with the Spirit. How do you do that? Do you just pray, Holy Spirit, fill me? Paul tells us in a very practical way in Colossians chapter 1, he says this, For this reason, since the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask. Here it is. Here's how you're filled with the Holy Spirit. We are praying that you may be filled in the full knowledge of His will. You begin by being filled with the Spirit, by being full of the Word of God. Know the Word. Know His will from the Old Testament, the commands in the New Testament, the comfort in in, in Psalms, the direction in Proverbs, the teaching in the epistles. Full knowledge of His will. That's the beginning of being filled with the Holy Spirit in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk worthy in a manner of the Lord. We're told to walk in the Spirit. Here it is. How do I walk in the Lord? Knowing the Word, reading the Word, memorizing the Word, loving the Word. And lastly, offer up to Him sanctified behavior. Offer up to the Lord this year Frankincense, sweet-smelling favor, savor, sanctified behavior. Back to Ephesians. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you. Love each other. A tender heart. You see... A life of holiness is like progressive holiness is like roses, red roses. 
But you know that we have not always had red roses? When the, first, when the rose was first brought to be uh, in the architect culture, it was like a stick. It was ugly. It bloomed only once a year. They didn't have it all year round. And it was nothing to really look at. However, in Asia, they had roses that bloomed all the time, but they were all sorts of different colors. So what they did is they brought the ones from Asia and they combined them with the ones here in the States. And over years of combining and putting together and working it, we have the red roses we have today. It takes time. But it's beautiful. And it smells gorgeous. Say to the Lord Jesus, I love you by offering Him your life to be sanctified. Heavenly Father, forgive me for not always being surrendered, not always being aware and choosing to give you my life from within and from without. Together we come before you, Father. And when we say we praise your name, we want to do it meaningfully by surrendering in our hearts all of these things that so easily entangle us so that we would live a life of beautiful, sanctified fragrance, glorifying your name and the power of your salvation that transforms lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. How great is it when we actually